Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are in the world today. My name is Ed Hodson, and on behalf of the IOSH International Railway Group Committee, who you'll meet all through the week, it is my pleasure to welcome you to our second virtual International Railway Conference. Uh, back on track is the theme, a phrase which may be overused at this time, but I think with the rail industries around the world beginning to recover from COVID-19, it's probably justified. So um, our conference starts today with our first webinar, and we're looking forward to hearing how plans for our great British Railways will actually keep us back on track. Uh, this afternoon, Nick Millington, the um, Director for Task for Safety at Network Rail, returns after a presentation last year following the Margin fatalities, and join us later to find out if the improvement, improvements that were promised have been delivered. Uh, tomorrow morning, we have an international perspective where I'm privileged to welcome Professor Vincent Ho and Alex Lau from Hong Kong to give us a view on intelligent safety and its use for protecting passengers and safety um, on the um, Hong Kong Mass Transit Railway. And in the afternoon, uh, European Safety and Sustainability Director Louise Ward will reflect on how railway employees have adapted in the circumstances we never imagined two years ago um, learning in the new normal for the rail industry. And then on Thursday, we will welcome Dr. Emma Taylor from Razor Secure, following her hugely successful um, webinar on cybersecurity earlier this year. Um, she'll be looking at uh, some further improvements and critical thinking in cybersecurity. And then we'll have uh, Jimmy Quinn closing our conference on Thursday. So today, I'd like to introduce Mark Phillips, the Chief Executive Officer for RSSB, uh, who will give us his response to the William Shapps white paper on the Great British Way Railways. Uh, Mark was appointed to the CEO of RSSB in 2016. He's also a member of the Transport for London and Department for Transport's Transport Research and Innovation Board. Now, Mark joined uh, British Rail and later the privatisation team, which is probably a very useful experience for Great British Railways. Where he worked for Railtrack, he was head of operational planning and engineering for Network Rail and regional director and deputy manager for London Eastern Railway. Mark is a fellow of the Railway Operators, Institute of Railway Oper Operators, sorry, and a fellow of the Institute of Logistics and Transport and brings a lot of experience from RSSB and the rail industry. I'd now like to introduce you, Mark, to our presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Edward. And um, apologies if uh, my voice is a little croaky uh, this morning, um, suffering a little bit from a cold. Um, and if I lose my place, particularly for those uh, joining in Britain, uh, I'm afraid I won't be able to give you any recent experience at Peppa Pig, uh, as it's something that I haven't done in over two decades since uh, my daughter was about that age. So uh, you'll just have to talk quietly amongst yourselves. I think I'd like to start by talking a little bit about the context of the rail review uh, carried out by Keith Williams and put that in the context of where we find rail in Britain uh, now. And what does that mean, particularly in the light of issues relating to safety? I think first it's important to remember that Keith Williams started his review way back in uh, May 2018. And frankly, that's a different age to where we are now. It was actually triggered by a series of uh, timetable debacles uh, caused by various operators and Network Rail together, where they didn't properly think through the implications of some late running infrastructure projects and how that would play out in terms of uh, timetables that had been planned. And when they were implemented, they simply weren't able to deliver the service that was required. That um, triggered the Secretary of State at the time to invite Keith Williams to carry out a review. And that's been um, progressing throughout the pandemic and was recently uh, published uh, earlier this year in terms of a report. But in that period, the rail industry itself has gone through a very substantial change, predominantly triggered by um, the pandemic. Many would argue that when the uh, report was triggered, it was actually to address some weaknesses in the decision making of the industry. Now, I would counter that by saying the decisions that were being made by uh, the industry at that time were entirely rational. 
It's just that the system itself required short term decisions to be made in order to meet short term goals. And what we're looking for here now in the future is a structure that will enable longer term planning so that uh, you can make the right decisions for the future. Because investing in rail is a very long term decision making process. It takes a long time to deliver infrastructure projects and then for the benefits of those projects to flow through and a little bit more of that uh, later in, in my talk. But I think it's important to remember that rail is a long term business and we have to factor that into longer term planning and decision making, which is something perhaps that the structure that we uh, currently have and certainly had at the time of the William started review was not really in place. Uh, obviously, then, since uh, he started his work, uh, COVID struck and it's absolutely decimated um, passenger demand uh, on Britain's rail network as it has around the world. And in Britain, in the first year of the pandemic, the government um, bankrolled it by effectively £10 billion additional funding during that period. It already provided substantial support, but uh, an additional £10 billion was required. And it's expected that north of uh, 5 billion will be required in this second year of the pandemic. And also, uh, interestingly, during that period, there were uh, increases in various safety risk indicators. And one of the most disturbing actually was around staff assaults. And we saw that um, the risk of a member of staff being either verbally or physically assaulted during the pandemic, despite um, only 5% of normal passengers using the system at the worst of the uh, pandemic, uh, the, the number of assaults continued to rise. And we think that this was partly as a result of frustrated passengers, frustrated with each other, frustrated with um, people uh, evading into their personal space uh, where they wanted to remain uh, isolated as part of their own personal protection from the pandemic. And so these were a number of issues that had to be uh, addressed as part of the response to uh, managing the, uh, the, the COVID um, problem through, through, through Britain. And it'd be interesting to learn whether or not other uh, in, uh, networks have seen a similar sort of rise in this particular uh, issue. But I think the issue that's currently facing the industry now is the degree to which the suppressed demand, currently about 65% compared to what it was pre-pandemic, uh, will rise and how long it'll take to rise back to uh, the pre-pandemic level. It is interesting to note that particularly um, tourism and uh, leisure travel, that has risen back almost to what it was before the pandemic, but uh, business travel and commuter travel remains seriously below the, uh, the pre-pandemic level. And I think it's um, of note that particularly in uh, office communities in London and the metropolitan cities, there is a very marked reluctance by people to return to normal office working. Uh, as, and certainly as we're proving here today, working from home is very much uh, the mode of the norm. And we will have to see how businesses change to the, the new hybrid working arrangements where you've got some time in the office and some time at home. In addition to uh, the COVID pandemic, we've also seen, I think, a further push on other uh, global challenges. Climate change is, continues to, to rise up the agenda and obviously Glasgow hosted the COP26 conference uh, just a couple of weeks ago. We're much more conscious of the impact of uh, the climate on the environment, the impact of air quality and uh, how we want to push for decarbonisation to make good the impact of um, previous generations of burning fossil fuels uh, in our society. We're also aware of um, supply chain issues, particularly in terms of uh, the impact on uh, people and the uh, impact of skills and how we need to grow people's capability so that they can be equipped for um, new working practices and new arrangements. And we're seeing pressures uh, in that uh, the employment sector, as people start to move around to find new areas of interest post the pandemic, as it's given them an opportunity to rethink what they actually want to do. And so starting to think about how uh, the uh, rail industry will cope with changes in employment, I think is going to be particularly 
uh, important for ensuring we've got the right capabilities in our organizations to uh, deliver the railway of the future. I think thirdly, international security and cybersecurity are going to remain uh, big topic issues, particularly as we move into a more digital railway, a more digitally enabled system, and making sure that we are adequately protected for the future is going to be really important. I think particularly turning to issues in Britain's rail sector, I've mentioned earlier that we are seeing quite a dramatic uh, change in terms of commuting, particularly um, the lack of travel on a Monday and Friday. We'd already seen a little bit of that pre-pandemic, but now I think it's, it's of a very substantive nature. And so people are traveling in Britain, particularly to offices on Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday. And so what does that mean in terms of timetable planning and planning for demand to meet that particular market? In 2019, uh, we elected a new government. Uh, that government is prepared to invest in rail, but particularly to meet uh, its own um, policy objectives about leveling up to provide equal opportunities for people around the country, uh, regardless of where they uh, happen to live. And rail offers a great opportunity to help address that um, uh, leveling up issue by providing uh, new infrastructure to connect uh, communities that may never have had a rail service or perhaps it was withdrawn in uh, earlier periods. But now I think there is uh, a great interest in providing that uh, connectivity to grow those communities to provide new opportunities for people, whether it's uh, work and business or social and leisure. So I think the government is most definitely interested in investing in rail, but I think we also have to recognise that it is looking for benefits in the short and medium term. To be more specific, it's looking for benefits in the lifetime of this parliament. And the problem with rail is that some of these projects take a very long time to mature and the benefits fall some years after. And so the government is looking for opportunities to invest quickly to deliver things um, to its uh, potential voters in the next election. We have to look to see how we can help uh, support that. I think there are also complexities around how you mix passenger and freight services on an already congested network. And so the opportunities to reduce bottleneck uh, congestion and provide uh, improved signaling systems so you can get more trains on the same um, track are all going to be features of how we need to plan uh, for a better railway into the future. And inevitably, when you're going through a mass uh, transformation as we are in Britain at the moment. There are worries about what um, may lead to potential safety issues, taking historical precedence into account. Um, RSSB was formed on the back of some tragic accidents, firstly at Labrook Grove, and secondly at Hatfield, where I had um, the, the sad occasion to actually visit the site of the accident with the then chief executive of Railtrack. And I think, written into um, the corporate memory of all rail organizations in Britain is to think through the safety implications of changes that you could be making as a consequence of business-led changes. And so making sure you've got the right decision-making and the right planning to avoid those uh, problems in the future is absolutely critically important. And finally, I think it's uh, without a doubt, and I'm sure um, most treasury functions across the world, we're looking to see how they can reduce the cost of running the business as usual railway while still investing in the railway to provide uh, longer term benefits uh, for the uh, electorate and society as a whole. Turning to a little bit to uh, our thinking about the, the Williams Shapps plan, uh, as it's been named when it was published earlier this year, I think first is that it has talked up uh, the the importance of rail to the industry and society at large. So it does recognise the economic benefits that uh, rail can deliver to uh, an economy and to its people. However, there is a lot of detail that's missing. It's only about 120 -ish pages long um, and it provides a broad landscape about what the future may offer. And now we're in the midst of starting to populate the detail as to how the organisation and its constituent parts will all work together collaboratively. And that isn't uh, just a, a chummy, cosy sense of 
uh, sitting around a campfire. It is about how you work constructively, how the uh, economic and relationships will operate uh, in order to secure the right outcomes for um, uh, obviously the passengers and the freight forwarders across uh, the network and the businesses themselves, because uh, we do want to continue to encourage uh, the private sector to contribute to uh, the rail system. And I think it's in this area that at the moment I have a degree of um, challenge, perhaps uh, even scepticism about how some of the, the work is being uh, evolving uh, in the sense that it is very strongly uh, focused on the infrastructure interests, principally around uh, network rail. And I think we need to see more about how the private sector will be uh, involved in providing some of the right solutions, whether that's through the supply chain or whether it's through operating the future concessions. One of the features of the BR system that uh, privatisation uh, didn't adopt, but I think was a very good one, was how we had bottom line accountability for infrastructure costs and the operating costs brought together at a sector level, whether it was intercity, network southeast, provincial, Scott Rail, and freight. And I think um, there's a lot to be said for bringing together the bottom line of uh, those uh, cost lines so you can actually make the right commercial decisions about how you expand or even contract the particular service that you uh, want to offer. And it also offers flexibility in terms of how you move rolling stock around the country to provide the best value. Uh, to um, the uh, passengers, depending on the service that you're looking to operate. And I think these are questions and challenges that we will be looking to see how they are addressed in the new structure of uh, the rail system, which is going to evolve over the coming years and hopefully will be in place by around uh, 2024. That's the sort of target date that I think uh, we're working for. I think it's also particularly important to make sure that we've got the right degree of uh, safety targets that we're looking to continuously improve safety, but not at any cost. It has to be done so efficiently, such that it, um, it's providing good value for money and is demonstrating that it is uh, the right approach to continue to improve the quality of businesses, the service that you provide to passengers and the value to the taxpayer, because ultimately uh, there is still a large amount of taxpayer funding that goes into a network, which even at its height pre-pandemic, only one in 10 um, um, members of the public actually used uh, in Britain. We're currently um, in Britain discussing uh, the government's integrated uh, rail plan. And I think this goes back to some of the challenges that I was referring to earlier, where the government is prepared to invest significantly, very significantly into um, uh, the rail industry. We've obviously got, already got uh, HS2 um, to Birmingham and to uh, Manchester, which is going to cost well over uh, 100 billion. And in addition to that, the, the uh, government's recently published an integrated rail plan with a further uh, 100 billion uh, in it. Now, some will argue that uh, it, it's disappointing in the sense that it isn't actually addressing the full uh, HS2 as originally envisaged with the uh, eastern leg to uh, Leeds. But I think the counter to that is that uh, it does offer some uh, benefits uh, sooner, such that um, people in, in constituencies in and around um, the uh, Transpennine route as it is between uh, Liverpool and uh, York will get some uh, early um, benefits from that investment. And I think it is about how you actually can demonstrate that you've got a, um, uh, a government that's listening to the needs of its uh, voters now and how you bring together that investment. And who's to say uh, HS2 might be um, funded and completed um, in, in a future generation. It's not ruling it out completely. It's just that maybe it's not quite the right solution uh, at the moment. And moving on to safety, I think we have to recognize with all of this change, whether it's the business level change about the um, William Shapps plan, or whether it's the implementation of some very important and significant infrastructure projects. That safety has to remain at the heart of how the uh, industry operates if it's going to be successful. The interfaces between the different engineering functions continue to be a challenge. 
And I think in the last uh, few years, we've had some very notable and serious accidents that we have to reflect on to look at well, what's going underneath here and how do we continue to improve the quality of uh, what uh, we do at work. Sadly, as I think might have been uh, mentioned on some of these um, uh, lectures before, uh, two track workers were killed at Margam in South Wales in July 2019. And it particularly highlighted issues uh, with red zone working. So effectively, um, the members of staff involved were carrying out work whilst uh, trains were still running in the adjacent uh, area. But also there were issues about lack of planning, the lack of protection for those staff, and the role of the lookout staff who were uh, essentially uh, designed there to, to protect the safety of those individuals that were carrying out the work. We had uh, a derailment at Carmen near Stonehaven in the midst of the pandemic uh, in August 2020. The driver, a guard and a passenger were tragically killed. And that was the impact of severe weather uh, where a torrential rain had uh, caused a washout of the drainage system, uh, boulders uh, fell onto the track and a train hit uh, those boulders and, and, and uh, derailed and went down the side of um, uh, a bank. And there are a number of um, issues arising from that, I think not least of which is obviously the impact of climate change and sudden change in weather patterns, but also the need to better understand the earthworks that the rail system uh, operates on. So. Um, we're doing a lot of work with Network Rail to try to provide uh, models that will predict how um, earthworks may respond to changes in, in weather patterns. More recently, we've had uh, what was um, thankfully not as serious as it could have been accident at uh, Salisbury in October 2021, where a train passed a signal of danger because it was unable to stop through low rail adhesion um, and uh, crashed into the side of the train just ahead of it. Um, in that instance, uh, sadly, uh, the, one of the drivers was um, seriously hurt, but uh, fortunately, he's making a recovery. And amongst all of that, there are uh, regular day-to-day -day, uh, accidents that sadly happen to passengers and members of the public, whether they are slip trips and falls. It can be um, smelly, fairly small events in their own right, but uh, nevertheless, they continue to uh, grow and we all have a role to ensure that we're doing the most we can to reduce the risk of passengers uh, getting harmed whilst travelling along around the rail system. So from that, um, we've been doing a lot of work over the last three or four years to develop uh, a strategic approach to, to, to managing risk. And um, we've termed that uh, leading health and safety on Britain's railways. We've addressed uh, the, nine, the 12 risk categories that we've identified across the whole of the system. And we've set in place uh, lead managers to take forward uh, solutions to address those particular risks. And we've structured that around uh, a five yearly approach whereby which we will move along a, a roadmap of initiatives and improvements to reduce the risks as we've identified them across those 12 areas to gradually uh, improve uh, safety across the, the rail system. And we're now in dialogue with uh, Great Britain's Railways transition team to implement a uh, longer term strategic plan. There's the whole industry strategic plan, uh, which will look out for 30 years. And this will be the backdrop to uh, Great British Railways as it's um, introduced in 2024. Uh, and it will have a 30 year plan, a 30 year view as to how the industry should uh, operate. And RSSB is contributing in a number of ways, but two principally. The first is about that 30 year uh, safety uh, uh, review and what we're looking to uh, achieve you know, over the course of that uh, 30 years. And also a, um, a sustainability uh, position such that we can start to move the industry from its current place, particularly where we have quite a significant extent of diesel operation to one where we probably have a greater degree of electrified uh, network and also alternative solutions to diesel trains where it's uneconomic to continue to electrify the network. So particularly looking at alternative uh, fuel sources, whether it's uh, battery power or hydrogen. Now, to underpin all of this work, uh, it's really important that we better understand the causes and issues relating to 
uh, safety incidents and uh, how they occur. And so in the last couple of years, we've started to look at the importance of data. And we've established a data insights team to bring together different data sets so that we can understand what potentially might be the causes um, and underlying issues uh, relating to uh, particular trends. Because it's, no, it's, it's just not sufficient to um, produce uh, reports that tally up uh, the number of incidents and compare them to what happened historically. We have to better understand what are the drivers to uh, safety performance. And so in the case of if we take the uh, Carment uh, derailment and the uh, extreme weather that um, uh, evolved at that particular uh, period in, in August uh, last year, what is the extent of rain that can fall that would actually cause uh, earthworks to become disturbed? Can you build a model that will actually predict uh, rainfall sufficiently ahead of um, uh, incident occurring so that you can take preemptive action and reduce uh, the, the, the speed of the service or, or the service actually operating in fairly localized issues with areas without having a, a massive impact on train performance across a wide area of the network. So we are heavily engaged in starting to bring together the benefits of these different uh, data sets to develop different models and, and hopefully home in our approach to being more accurate with our recommendations about addressing uh, safety risk. So I think um, there are some uh, opportunities to take heart. Firstly, yes, the railways have had a, a massive uh, knock in terms of um, the public's usage of them during the pandemic. But ridership is increasing, particularly in leisure and um, uh, tourism. I think uh, there's a lot to be done yet in terms of better understanding what the commuter market will be in the years to come, but certainly it's a challenge at the moment. But having said that, government remains committed to invest in the future, to invest to help grow economies uh, around the country so that there is uh, fair opportunities for all. And with that big transition, whether it's building new infrastructure projects, whether it's actually reshaping the, the way in which the railway operates for the future, then safety remains at the heart of that. There are some continued areas that we need to address, some trends that remain worrying, but by taking new approaches, by looking at a, a data-led approach, a scientific approach, we can start to ensure the investment in rail safety delivers a better bang for its buck and we can be more efficient and make a better contribution to um, uh, reducing the business's usual costs of operating the railway to facilitate a greater investment in the longer runs and the longer returns. But finally, if you're an IOSH uh, member and uh, you belong to an RSSB member or affiliate, do please make best advantage of all the materials available on our website. You can log in and download um, many useful documents, some of which I've referred to in the course of um, my talk today. Uh, if you're not a member of RSSB, then do come and talk to us because I'm sure uh, we can have a useful conversation about how you might uh, take advantage of some of the uh, material that's available and it may indeed contribute to some of your CPD uh, studies and, and help you in your um, uh, final um, assessment for your uh, qualification. But thank you very much indeed for inviting me here to talk to you today and um, good luck for the future. Thank you. Mark, thank you very much for the presentation. It was um, much better than uh, reading through uh, 130 pages and uh, probably more informative as well. Um, I think we'll save questions for later when we um, had Ali's uh, presentation, which will dovetail nicely into that. I certainly had a few questions of my own written down. Um, so thank you very much, Mark. It was really good. Uh, I'd like to now introduce uh, Ali Tagini, uh, the, the Director of Systems and Safety and Health, to give us a perspective of health and safety uh, and sustainability in the Great British Railways. Um, and let's see if the recommendations can be delivered, although I don't think many of us may be around in 30 years uh, to hear them all. <laughs> um, Ali has uh, some great experience. Um, in railways, he's a chartered engineer with over 30 years experience in um, systems assurance, the Riyad Metro and he regulated rail projects in uh, Dubai and the UAE, uh, both in light and heavy rail systems. Also with experience of the regulatory authorities uh, with the implementation of policies and safety management systems. 
So um, welcome, Ali, and uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much indeed, Ed. Good morning, all. Um, pleasure to be here in front of you, um, presenting, uh, really uh, picking up on some of the core themes that, uh, that Mark uh, explained, uh, described earlier on, uh, in particular, picking up on the need for uh, long-term planning and the whole system solutions that GBR needs uh, in order to not only maintain, but improve health and safety performance in smarter and cost-effective ways. So what I'm, what I'm uh, uh, presenting to the Irish Rail Group members today is really at that health and safety program of GBR and the role that RSSP is playing in terms of developing health and safety chapter uh, for, for the WISP, the whole industry strategic plan, uh, the, 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 the strategy that Mark alluded to, and how we are working to integrate uh, the other strategy that Mark referred to, leading health and safety on Britain's railways, the strategy that RSSP has been leading um, for, for the past five years, um, how, to into how we are working uh, with uh, GBR, the GBR transition team, and with the Network Rail uh, Technical Authority to integrate really the, the, the tactical LHSBR, leading health and safety on Britain's railways, uh, 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 strategic objectives uh, into, the, into the WISP. So uh, the, the ambitions of the WISP, uh, well, safety is an absolute given. It's not an optional. Uh, I think, again, as, as Mark said, we must maintain current uh, levels of safety performance, uh, and we must do it in the ways that we have been doing, uh, certainly over the past you know, couple of decades, in terms of taking a risk-based, evidence-based approach, collaborative approach, really the sort of uh, uh, capability that RSSP, the sorts of approaches and, 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 and engagements that RSSP is at is at the heart of. However, uh, GBR also has needs to address some very big strategic challenges and problems. Uh, and, and really um, what it needs in order to be able to do that is not to be stymied or held back um, by, by undue uh, onerous health and safety uh, requirements, uh, effectively disproportionate levels uh, of, 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 of resource uh, allocation. Uh, so it needs pragmatic approaches uh, to meet the white paper's timescales and to address the health and safety challenges in cost-effective ways. Um, this is really where RSSB um, uh, uh, plays, plays a key role in terms of the development of the core capabilities we have, uh, many of which Mark uh, mentioned in terms of our risk-based approach, our, our tools and techniques, and, and our data-led uh, um, uh, capabilities, uh, and, and really integrating, using all those capabilities to integrate LHSPR, Leading Health and Safety and Britain's Railways, within, within the WISP, uh, uh, and, 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 and really uh, supporting the GBR transition team and the Network Rail uh, Technical Authority in, in producing the health and safety chapter of the WISP. So just for those of you who may not be familiar with LHSPR, and, and excuse, if, if, uh, excuse me if I use the acronym, it'll be a lot quicker to, to get through. Uh, but the LHSPR uh, overview, for those of you who may not be familiar, please do go on the RSSP website, the link that Phil just posted. Um, if you are, if your organizations are affiliates, uh, you'll be able to, or members, you'll be able to um, really be able to delve into the details of this strategy. Uh, the LHSPR strategy was, was developed, was launched by RSSP back in 2016. It was subsequently uh, updated and, and revamped in, in 2020. Um, it, it, strategy really addresses 12 key uh, areas. Uh, these areas are uh, essentially risk areas uh, that are either a single duty holder or a combination of single duty holder and, and external multi-stakeholder. So single duty holder uh, type of risks might be those that Mark uh, mentioned in the context of Margam, uh, track worker safety issues, uh, or, or ones that are, are specifically related to level crossings, uh, risk associated with level crossings and the, and the, uh, the influence of stakeholders and, and outside uh, parties in, 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 in that uh, risk profile. Uh, the uh, the uh, core to the to the 12 areas is um, really the development of uh, cross-cutting uh, 
uh, capabilities that uh, that industry needs in order to be able to really address uh, and and provide solutions to provide insights into better understanding of some of these risk areas and then to develop solutions really in order to tackle uh, and provide cost effective deliver cost effective solutions uh, to proportionate solutions to to address some of these key key risk areas uh, in 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 a in a um, in a collaborative manner, uh, the strategy itself is described uh, on our website. Uh, the, the, the strategy at the, the high level strategy sets out the key strategic challenges and what we are doing to address those challenges. Um, the, the vision around you know what the industry wants to try and achieve um, within a relatively short medium term. So you know within a five year period, where is it that industry intends to be uh, in 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 addressing. Some of these strategic challenges. Um, the uh, uh, strategy also sets out at the lower level the, the, the works, the, the, the program of works, the roadmaps that are being have been developed really to uh, ensure that uh, that we deliver as, as an industry with RSSB's support, we deliver uh, products and services, solutions to address some of the key themes really to try and uh, bring down uh, and improve uh, uh, safety performance, uh, to bring down risk and, and to improve safety performance. Uh, the, the, how was the strategy developed? Well, it was done through a, a process of very uh, intensive consultation with industry, uh, key leaders within industry, uh, industry groups um, that, that I'll describe in a, in a minute, and also uh, really kind of linking uh, what we we are doing what we are proposing to do with the ORR's uh, strategic uh, risk chapters and with uh, investigations that uh, the Rail Accident Investigation Branch um, uh, has been publishing and recommendations that uh, rape has been has been um, uh, disseminating. Um, all this, is, as uh, Mark and Phil have described, is available on our website for your perusal. Uh, just very quickly, uh, what the what the sort of governance uh, framework looks like around LHSBR. Twelve risk themes, risk areas, as I described earlier, um, and and those are really. Um, those report into at the top you see the, the light blue box so those areas of risk associated with health and well-being and fatigue report into a, a top level group called the rail well-being alliance and 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 those are essentially health and well-being related issues the safety issues those those in the, um, the green the uh, boxes are, are the groups that effectively monitor safety performance um, against the, the, the particular risk areas uh, assigned to those risk groups. These are all industry groups led by senior chairs uh, from within the industry, uh, collaborative groups that brings in uh, various uh, constituencies that are really uh, most interested in the safety performance around um, issues such as public behavior, uh, an issue that Mark picked up in his, in his uh, example of the staff assaults um, uh, uh, issue that he mentioned earlier on. So the, the chairs and the constituents really look at performance, look at insights provided by RSSB. Uh, the, the input essentially is um, from our data insights directorate, from the work that we do in analyzing and profiling risk. And then the, the groups are, are tasked with, with assessing uh, where industry is, whether whether risk is going in the in the, in, the, in, the, in the direction that that uh, addresses the objectives, the strategic objectives, or whether interventions are needed really to try and um, improve safety performance. Um, the, the 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 other key aspect of, of support that RHS, RSSP provides, uh, the particular director that, that I lead, is is options, options really for taking safe decisions, for, 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 for helping um, introduce effective, impactful solutions to address risk areas in, in, in meaningful ways. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the green boxes are, are, are um, reporting to the system safety risk group. Uh, and uh, the um, entire structure is managed or monitored by uh, the leading health and safety on Britain's Railways Executive Advisory Group, LEAG, the other acronym. I'm afraid you'll see a lot of acronyms throughout the course of this presentation. That's that's one of the that's one of the uh, artifacts of, of working in the industry in the rail industry. But but the the LEAG um, is is there as the monitoring group, as the 
top level senior group that really looks to see, takes the pulse of the strategy. Is the strategy doing what it was meant to do? Is it doing the right things? And are the groups achieving an industry doing things in the right way? Um, it, 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 it monitors, it, it, uh, we report to LIAG on a, on a, on a, on a, uh, every couple of months, every two or three months, uh, really to ensure that there is visibility in terms of the performance of the strategy and the effectiveness of the strategy. And the LIAG uh, senior level group then reports uh, into the RSSB board. Uh, just as a, as a kind of a very, very practical example, um, in April 2020, we obviously, um, uh, as a result of the uh, severe uh, uh, reduction in services, we noticed um, a, a, a drop in, in SPADs. However, recently, uh, particularly with empty coaching stock, we're seeing an uptick in, in, in SPADs. And that led us to um, proactively uh, intervene and say, okay, well, we need to, before the, the full resumption of services, hopefully in the next uh, months, uh, we need to uh, really inform industry and engage with industry on what it can do in order to um, really manage uh, SPADs in, 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 in more effective ways, having had this, 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 this uh, lull, this, this period uh, of, of COVID over the past 18 months. Uh, so we... Um, produced a, an evaluation tool that really links to our SPAD management guidance and, and helps uh, train operating companies, freight operating companies, to evaluate their own SPAD management interventions across a range of factors, not just drivers, but also competence, accident investigation, uh, driver managers. And it's a real, it's an example of a real practical tool that train operating companies and freight operating companies can use uh, based linking into the guidance that we have produced over the years really in order to be able to um, map their, their current performance and, and do it either on a, on, a, on a monthly periodic basis or do it annually, um, either to get a snapshot or to get a, to get a kind of moving uh, average of how their performance against a range of factors uh, is, 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 is benchmarked against good practice. Um, again, you'll see a lot of examples of the sort of practical uh, concrete materials that we have been producing and we do produce um, on our website. Um, please, please do. To, um, have a look. Uh, the uh, political context behind the WISP, and now moving on to the WISP uh, uh, away from LHSBR. Uh, well, uh, these are uh, the, the the five strategic objectives in the WISP, you know, absolutely enshrined in the WISP are uh, drawn from government policy, current government policy uh, around meeting customer needs, the, the, the many of the issues that Mark already touched on in his pre previous presentation. Core to this is value for money and affordability, and in the submission to the Secretary of State that must be made uh, in, in uh, 2022, there must be a very strong narrative as to, you know, what is, what, what is the outcome? What is, the, what is the benefit in terms of uh, the sorts of uh, strategic initiatives that the health and safety chapter of the WISP uh, will encompass. So these narratives must be compelling and, and actually you know, must be uh, costed in a way that uh, meets the affordability um, uh, uh, criteria that uh, was set out earlier on. An overview of the WISP, uh, obviously it's the um, it's the uh, whole industry strategic plan um, being developed in response to the William Shapps uh, white paper that, that Mark mentioned. Mark also mentioned the parallel work streams that are going on. So certainly within RSSB, uh, key directorates are working in support of the sector target operating model, the structure around the sector target operating model, the assurance arrangements needed as a result of changes uh, that, that, the, that the STOM, another acronym I'm afraid, uh, will, will, will will give rise to and then the WISP itself addresses a number of so apart from health and safety a number of cross-cutting themes including freight operations passengers um, the, the people chapter absolutely important in terms of competence over the over the long term looking at the demo, demographics of the of the rail industry in the long term sustainability and innovation um, the 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 chapter is as, as I said led by RSSB work supporting the GBR uh, transition team and working with the technical authority of Network Rail, and its real purpose is to integrate the tactical LHSBR, the, the shorter term LHSBR strategic objectives and vision with the longer term uh, WISP uh, uh, strategy and objectives. The time frame is, is uh, white paper has to be produced uh, for submission to the Secretary of State uh, as per the white, uh, sorry, the WISP uh, document must be produced as per the uh, timeline set out in the, in the white paper and submitted to the Secretary of State. 
Um, where are we? Well, we are um, going through an intensive process of engagement and discussions with, with industry. Uh, we've had a, a, a number of uh, stakeholder workshops uh, with the very senior members of the rail industry, ready to set out the strategic health and safety challenges and opportunities and, and, and drill down and disaggregate those into exactly what those safety challenges and opportunities mean. Um, we've done, we've taken a very bottom up approach, but that will be complemented with a top down approach, again, bringing in the LEAG, the Leading Health and Safety on Britain's Railways uh, Executive Advisory Group, to, to take that top perspective and, and to make sure that the, that the political imperatives that I set out uh, earlier on, that those are being met and those are being addressed in, in meaningful and tangible ways. Um, so, so that's really the process we're going to. Uh, and, and essentially the workshops, uh, uh, the topics, the four topics are, are set out in that box at the bottom. At the bottom, uh, the, 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 the the report is being developed at the moment, and it will be trans uh, submitted to the uh, GBR transition team in due course uh, for, um, as I said, the the ultimate goal of of submission to the Secretary of State um, along the timeline set out in the in the William Shat white paper. Um, the, just a word or two around the challenges and opportunities. Um, the yeah, again, these, these, these have all been stated, but better health and safety performance, what do we mean, what targeted risk-based investments, for example, reducing the impact of uh, managing health and safety on services, less time needed for inspections and maintenance, uh, improved reliability and availability, uh, reducing the time cost to introduce changes, enabling innovation, um, really an optimized approach. I, I, those who are familiar with, with RSSP's work, the, the seminal taking safe decisions Approach, you know, ensuring that that is enshrined and, and, and really embodied uh, within the WISP. Ultimately, we're looking uh, to ensure that there are long term uh, areas for investment that will de deliver a healthy and safer, safer railway uh, and to do it uh, in, in very cost effective ways. Uh, the workshops, uh, many themes, uh, needless to say that uh, 88 key uh, areas have been elicited and are being uh, weaved into the report to the health and safety chapter uh, that we are producing for, for, for the GBR transition team. And that essentially the write up around that and the, the top level review uh, by, by the senior group will essentially be our submission for the for the stage one uh, of the of the WISP health and safety chapter. Uh, the key themes, and this is very much work in progress, uh, but essentially, uh, oops, sorry. So greater standardization, um, this, is, this is what our elicitation really is coming up with, better design and better systems integration um, is, is likely to improve system performance. And I think, I think that's, that's, uh, that's, it goes without uh, needing to be emphasized. A better understanding of system performance um, using data uh, will enable a risk-based approach to design operation and maintenance. And Mark, in that context, mentioned the work that we're doing on Earthworks, using big data techniques and our risk capability in order to be far more granular in terms of uh, ensuring that risk is managed um, in, in, in more localized ways uh, and in, in more effective ways, rather than in a way that possibly transfers risk and hazard to, to other parts of the network. Uh, and then finally, again, key emerging themes that, that we're developing into the health and safety chapter, how the railway is designed, operated, maintained. Um, this, this, this will introduce new challenges. Uh, the industry needs to ensure that its processes for managing these are efficient, are efficient and effective. And, and these are really uh, the areas around skills, competence, looking at the demographics of the railway and working very closely with the people chapter of the WISP to ensure that these requirements are understood. Different processes will require different uh, types of competencies. Uh, and, and really, it's the long term vision and the long term look that will enable us to, to flesh out and flesh those out in meaningful ways. So in conclusion, um, uh, the, the, the uh, focus is on long term activities and investment that uh, address uh, long term health and safety challenges, linking the LHSBR with the BISP's longer term strategic goals will ensure that we manage health and safety in smarter ways, reduce the impact of managing health and safety on services, and reduce the time and cost to introduce changes. I'd be very glad and in fact uh, would uh, love to have your feedback and any questions that I can take back to the, to the WISP team and the GBR transition team on the back of that presentation and Mark's presentation. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Ali. I think that uh, did uh, dovetail quite well into Mark's presentation. So we've got uh, probably in two presentations, um, a really thorough oversight of the Shaps Williams plan and um, how it's actually going to work. And I think um, my biggest question was, do you have, does RSSB have the resources to do all that work and put all that input into it um, alongside the current rail um, infrastructure and all the work that's going on now? Um, so perhaps Edward, I'll, I'll start and then um, Ali can um, add on to my comments. So we have identified some specific resource to uh, work on the arrangements for the transition plan, both in terms of, if you like, the structure of the organisations and how RSSB will fit uh, with um, Great Britain's railways and uh, other entities. And we've also put in some additional resource specifically to contribute to the whole industry strategic plan that we've referred to. Um, but inevitably that work will continue to absorb more and more time and we remain ever cognizant of the uh, extent of um, the resource that we need to put into it because we obviously have a very keen uh, interest in making sure that we're addressing issues of the moment. So how we, uh, Ali's team particularly and uh, Tom Lee's team from a standards point of view, how they remain focused on the current risks are, are just as important. And so making sure we keep a good balance between contributing to planning to work for the future and addressing issues of the moment are things that we constantly keep in play as part of our uh, resource review and our uh, development of our sort of business plan on a year by year basis. Uh, and the other question I had is the, the actual direct input to the uh, Great British Railways transition team. How, how does that work and what is the, the level of input? Is it, you know, is it completely separate from RSSB or is it with other working groups as well? well? We're heavily involved and as I said at the start, we have actually identified a senior member of the team to contribute to that design work itself. Uh, and as required, I, I obviously get involved when necessary, as do um, my fellow executive committee members. So we are really um, uh, raising our contribution to this to make sure the industry gets the right solution, particularly taking into account our involvement as an independent body for safety and standards and how we can play our role to the, to the full. Okay, thank you very much. Phil, have you um, looked at any questions that have come through? Yeah, there's a, there's a couple of questions in there. Uh, one, one for Mark, an interesting one. Are you aware of any of the projections into the future uh, to get from the, you know, the current 65, 70% run rate that we're at now? Uh, and any idea of the, the plans to address uh, further model shift? So Andrew Haynes has um, set up a revenue recovery team as part of the uh, Great Britain's transition uh, arrangements. Uh, and they are looking to see how um, uh, different solutions may bring in um, uh, a higher number of passengers. But I think ultimately, um, much of this is still unknown because we don't really understand the degree to which um, people will start to commute again. That's the key to this and the degree to which people will return to uh, working in offices. And it's very, very difficult to predict the pace at which that um, will change. And I think probably we're starting to think about the longer term solution about well, what are the policies that are needed to attract people away from using their cars and onto public transport. And I would suggest that the solution is not um, rail alone. It's how you actually get a combined public transport solution. So how do you get a better bus network to service connecting hubs into rail systems? And in some cases, it might be putting in place guided buses or new tram systems. So you actually completely change the uh, attraction to using public transport from one which at the moment, if we're honest, is very heavily geared towards the private motorist. And so I think, you know, that is going to be you know, a decades long project. It's not a it's not a quick fix um, because, uh, uh, you know, the changes are going to affect society and particularly the move to decarbonisation requires a lot of thinking through and development. It's not something that's going to be solved in, in, a, in a very short time frame, I believe. Thank you. Just, just one more question that was in there. <clears throat> a question from Robert was, how do we get more access to maintain the railway without reducing the number of trains or working at night where the risk can be potentially higher? Ali, do you want to take that one? 
Well, means yes. So, um, I mean, that really is a question that uh, I think we can uh, take to uh, Nick Millington later on this afternoon as well. So, Nick's um, uh, initiatives in, as, in leading the task force, um, uh, really better ways of planning, better ways of ensuring that uh, interventions are, are are planned in a way to to in, to to uh, really. Um, maximize uh, uh, availability of, uh, of, 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 of operational uh, hours uh, and, and to ensure that uh, we take people away from operational uh, railways. Um, so a lot still to do has been achieved and still to do around better planning, better, better possession planning, better management of, of inspection and maintenance activities, but also the role of technology, the role of technology in, in really investment needed to introduce more remote condition monitoring more ways of actually being able to do a lot of the evaluations and assessments uh, without putting people um, in the way of uh, trains and operations. Thanks, Ali. No more questions, Ed? No, I think that's, um, I think if it was anything like me, I was just taking it all in because despite knowing about the uh, new Great British Railways in the last two years, this is probably the first time I've got some really in-depth information in the background of what's going on without, you know, just picking up on a few headlines in the report. Um, and I'm just wondering if, you know, perhaps that's something that's missing uh, with, you know, perhaps timescales of when this will take place, what the plan is in respect of timescales, one year, two year, this will be in place. Um, so I, is there any um, information on that, Mark? It is evolving. Um, and, and I think it's around the <clears throat> complexity of the interfaces between the different organisations, the design work that's needed. And um, at the moment, uh, finding the right amount of legislative time in the government's agenda to um, uh, implement the white paper. So at the moment, the planning assumption is that it will be spring 2024 by the time all the legislation is in place to enable uh, GBR to, to, to go live. Um, but I would suggest that one of the other factors that you need to take into account is uh, when the next general election may fall, because, of course, that can always disturb the parliamentary timetable. So, um, you know, that that is geared very much on the assumption that uh, there's a fair win to get all the legislation in place. OK, <clears throat> Mark, Ali, uh, if I could just thank you both very much. Like I said, I think uh, we'd all heard about the Great British Railways, but hadn't actually got into any great detail other than the white paper. So that's been really informative and very helpful uh, to the webinar. So thank you very much. And uh, if you, as you mentioned, looking forward this afternoon, Nick Millington will hopefully answer some of those questions that were raised as well on safety. And um, another interesting thing was Vincent Ho um, tomorrow is talking about, you know, the safety on the mass transit railway in Hong Kong and looking how they're using innovations um, and safety together to improve passenger safety. So uh, it leaves me to thank you very much for joining us all today. And thank you, Mark. Thank you, Ali. And uh, good afternoon. Thank you.